can get started. So I'll turn it over to Coach for an opening statement. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us virtually. And uh, it's been a good couple of weeks. It's been a lot of fun watching uh, Wake Forest golfers perform at Augusta National. So certainly a, a shout out to, to Will. Uh, incredible job at his, his first Masters. Um, and uh, Amelia, what she did there as well, finishing the runner up in the uh, women's amateur. And, uh, you know, that's the neat thing at Wake Forest. I, I certainly met Will and I've gotten to know, uh, you know, Amelia during her time here and, uh, you know, both impressive people and doing a great job of, of representing Wake Forest uh, on the biggest stage there is in their, in their respective sports, uh, men's and women's golf. So we're really proud of them. Uh, we had a good uh, scrimmage on Saturday. Uh, thanks to our band and our cheer squad for being there, uh, trying to create a little bit of a game atmosphere for our younger guys, and we got good work in. We continue to have productive practices, continue to stay healthy, which is just as critical, and uh, we've got two left. So we'll go tomorrow, and we'll work some situations tomorrow, and then we'll head down to the stadium on Saturday and, and kind of have a practice and a uh, – you know, scrimmage some of the younger guys again for the last practice. Uh, and then we'll, we'll start turning our attention to the summer. So um, I'm about to be in a bad mood here. As you guys know, I, I love the spring. Um, I wish we could do this for two months or three months, uh, but we got practices 14 and 15 coming up and, and then we'll call it a wrap and then start back into our, our summer training and have our guys finish up with finals and end of the year papers and all the things that go into being a Wake Forest student athlete. With that, I'll open it up for questions. Dave, I was, I got to thinking about spring practice and usually it's a little chillier out cause you guys do, you know, earlier in the spring, does it help when there's some humidity and stuff like that? Cause it kind of prepares you a little bit for August in some respect. Is it a little bit better having it uh, later like this? Uh, I, I don't know, John, I think, you know, when we get back in January and February, our biggest focus is on getting our guys stronger. Um, that is, and especially having the whole year without being in the weight room. And so I, I don't get as worried about conditioning levels uh, in March and April. Uh, to me, after we're done with this, the transition will go into getting stronger again. And then there's a period there in late June, July that the strength coaches and the conditioning coaches really start uh, preparing the guys to what, what we would call a game week load. So the amount of distance, the speeds, the change of direction uh, that mimics a game week. And so we are much less concerned with that in spring than we are in the summer. Um, so, you know, the humidity work, um, you know, we need it. I just don't know how much having that in early April is going to help you in August and September. Steve, in the past, that 15th practice has been the install for the for the week one. Is there any reason why that's not the case this year? Um, we're kind of doing that with tomorrow's practice. So we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time uh, on, on some of the things that we're going to see schematically that are different, that our offense and defenses don't present to each other. So, you know, it's the nature of spring practice everywhere. Um, our offense gets so used to going against our defense and our defense gets so used to going against our offense that I always like taking that one practice and just showing some different things. And so we're going to take some time tomorrow and a little bit of time on Saturday and spend some times that we'll see the first couple of weeks of the season that our, our offense and defenses don't present to each other during spring football. I know you still got two left, so this answer might, might could change in the next two practices, but if you had to evaluate it now, who are, who are the biggest risers? Who, who are the guys who have taken the most advantage of, of the spring and kind of really stepped up and taken their next steps? Uh, I mean, I could go, you know, I'll kind of go positionally side of the ball. Um, 
you know, certainly Justice Ellison and, and Christian Turner and Quentin Cooley and Amani Marshall, all those other running backs, other than, you know, we've always kind of been a two-headed monster in the backfield. Um, you know, whether it was uh, Caden Carney and Matt Colburn or, um, you know, Cade and Kenneth, Cade and Christian, Chris, uh, Christian and Kenneth, we got Christian back and uh, Justice Ellison has taken another step. Christian Turner from Michigan is a very, very good football player. Um, and seeing Quentin Cooley and Imani Marshall make steps as well as encouraging. Certainly at receiver, to me, the two guys that have really jumped out are, is Donald Stewart and Jamal Banks. Uh, those guys are markedly different than they were uh, last fall. I mean, both those guys were here for the first time. We're just getting their feet wet with the offense, their comprehension of what we're doing, the speed at which they're playing with. Uh, they're processing less, thinking less, reacting faster. That's very exciting. Uh, on the offensive line, um, you know, that next group of guys, uh, you know, Devontae Gordon, George Sell, Luke Pettibone, uh, have all making really, really nice steps. Uh, you know, Christian Forbes, you know, CJ Elmanus, I mean, we're, we've, we're going to have depth on the O-line, um, you know, again, and that's one of the advantages of getting JV Ante Nash better. And then you got, you know, three fifth-year seniors or, or now fifth-year juniors with Zach Tom, Sean McGinn, and Loic Naya. We've bought another year of development with some of those younger players. Uh, defensively, uh, Jasheen Davis, to me, is a guy that every practice – He's going to be able to help us next year. You know, to me, when you're red shirt guys or their freshman year, it's always a matter of, okay, with the good players, is it year two or year three? Jasheen Davis, it's going to be year two. Uh, at linebacker, I think Jalen Hudson has had a really good spring. He is playing faster, very similar to what I said about the receivers. Um, you know, we get smart guys at Wake Forest. Jamal Banks and Donald Stewart and Jalen Hudson are really, really smart guys. And sometimes those smart guys, you know, they process and the processing slows them down. And there's a certain point where it starts to click that they now understand it. They play faster. They play quicker. They're reacting better. We're starting to see that with Jalen. And, and certainly uh, Chase Jones is healthy now. And, you know, we have uh, Luke and we have Ryan Smenda. But seeing Chase Jones and Jalen make that progress is exciting. The two young corners continue to get better, Kalen Carson and Gavin Holmes. And then J.J. Roberts is a, a safety that to me has, like some of those other guys, you know, like a Justin Ellison or Jamal Banks, you're seeing him start to take that step. And those to me are the, the plus ones that you have the guys that are back from last year you know, if you look at who played for us, we're really only missing two offense and defensive players that were regular players, and that's Boogie and Jaquez. And so you got everybody else back other than Jack Crane, who we're going to miss. Um, and now you have all these risers that whatever that line is of not being quite ready to be playable, those guys are all starting to take that, that jump past that line which is exciting. And it's exciting not only for the 21 season, but it's exciting for the 22 and 23 season. You know, you redshirt these guys and you hope they're hits. And after that first year, you're, you're not always sure. And then by year two and three, some of them come into their own and some of them don't make that step. The number of players that are making that step is really exciting. Dave, do you look at many of those mock drafts to see about boogie are, are you do you pay attention to all those there's about a hundred mock drafts do you look at those at all um not not really i mean every some of the big ones um you know i mean I, i'm on twitter with some of our and i follow our players and whether it's boogie or some of our guys retweeting something about boogie those are the things that'll show up on my timeline what do you think is what do you think is his best attribute? Is it his speed around the edge? Is that going to be his kind of calling card? I mean, John, he's a guy that's six three and a half, six four, two hundred and seventy four pounds, and he ran a sub four six forty. That's just not a normal skill set. And then, 
you can say, okay, he's got the size, he's got the speed. And then, you know, there's always guys, uh, and in college recruiting, we call them camp guys, that they go to camp and they do all the change of direction drills well, and they're fast and they're strong, but then you put on the film and they're not productive. That's not the case with Boogie. He has all those measurables, and then you put on the tape and he's productive. I mean, how many consecutive games did he have a TFL? That, that's not an accident. Um, you don't just end up with that many TFLs. You know, I mean, maybe now and then you can get a player and you run a twist and he comes free. Um, his consistent production for us the last three years shows up on film. And, you know, this year he might have played a little heavy. And so he, he lost some weight. And I think he, you know, he showed that athleticism um, that people saw in pro day. And he, he probably showed a little bit more the year before. Um, but I, again, I just think that combination of speed, size, position, flexibility, um, he's going to make somebody a really good player. You know, he's going to be a really good player for someone. Dave, was there any uh, thought of opening up for the public on Saturday? Or cause I was on vacation last week, so I didn't hear anything. Was there any thought of doing that? Not really. I just think we're, you know, we've, we've been on this road so long. We've been so cautious. And, you know, just I don't think we want to jeopardize any way that the school views how, you know, we're hoping that we'll be able to open up the stadium. And I just think we're, we're, we're close to hopefully the end of the, you can start seeing, you know, the end of the tunnel. And we don't want to do anything that puts people at risk. And we're just, it's an abundance of caution, but we're, you know, we've gotten, we're one of the few teams in the ACC that I think got through spring practice without having to take a break. And it's because we've been closed, we've been cautious, we've been careful. Um, you know, to me, the benefit of opening it up doesn't outweigh the potential negatives of if we'd have an outbreak, the way people could view next season. So let's, let's get safe, let's get to the end, and hopefully we'll be able to have a, a full stadium uh, in September. Dave, you talked about not having a COVID break. Uh, this will be practice number 14 tomorrow for you guys. How's your team holding up through that grind? And then from a scheduling perspective, is there anything that you'll take from this year's spring camp and kind of transplant it moving forward in terms of the timing or anything that you all did differently? Well, again, Les, we, we push things back for really two reasons. Uh, you know, number one was just the length of last season. You know, if you remember, we brought our players back July 1st. And because we played in a late December bowl game, we went six straight months without our kids being able to go home and see their parents for a weekend. Um, so that was just such a long stretch. And I thought there was a burnout and a fatigue involved um, that if we started spring too early, you know, you almost football is one of those sports that I think once our players get away from it, they're then anxious to do it again. And I, I didn't want to run the risk of starting too soon. Um, I really felt that we needed to get in the weight room and get stronger. And then the other thing is because it's still a dead period, typically our coaches are allowed to go on the road April 15th. And because it was dead, you know, part of our reason for starting late February, early March has always been to be finished by April 15th. So our coaches could get in the road and evaluate the next recruiting class. And because of the dead period and the inability to get out, there was no reason to finish early. Um, so uh, we'll see how next season goes. Um, and we'll see where, how next season finishes. But um, I like starting a little bit later. Uh, but I, I, I still think that as from a recruiting standpoint, you know, you, you still want to be able to be one of the first schools in to see your top players. Dave, yesterday I saw uh, Garrison Tubbs, a soccer player. He was getting vaccinated up at the fairgrounds. How are those stats going for you guys? I mean, are most of the players all vaccinated or have got one or two, one or maybe their second shots or how, how, is the, how are those stats doing? Um, I, I think, you know, within two weeks, um, I think we'll be about 60% or so. Um, now, some of the players 
who had COVID are a little bit uh, reluctant to get it just because uh, I think the effect, it, it appears that if you get it right after you get COVID, the vaccine can make you a little sicker. Um, and again, we're at a point right now that we're recommending it. Um, we're not making it mandatory, uh, but over half of our players right now um, have got at least one of the two shots. And I, I wanna say about a third of our football team is probably fully vaccinated right now. So, you know, again, I, I, certain schools are starting to make it mandatory. Uh, we're not there yet, um, you know, but it, it seems like that, that trend is starting. Hey, Dave, Ralph Russo from the Associated Press. I wanted to jump in with something. Uh, first of all, good to see you. Um, good to see you. You're in Brooklyn? I, I'm in Brooklyn, exactly. Right. Yes, yeah. Uh, so if you hear a little noise in the background, there's, as always, some work being done outside our window. Um, that, that's what it is. If you hear a jackhammer, that, that's what it is. Um, so we're going to have some new transfer rules coming up. It, it, it's not surprising. We, we've known we're heading toward this, you know, one-time exception. Everybody's eligible after the first time. Uh, but now it's going to finally be here. As a coach whose program doesn't you know, I think it's fair to say doesn't go too deep into transfers, generally speaking. How have you thought of, well, how am I going to maybe change some things around? Where do I have to maybe um, restructure to, A, take advantage of the fact that more kids are transferring? And also, B, to make sure that I manage my roster in a way where I, I don't have a ton of kids leaving. Like, like, how do you, you know, do you sit down with them more and sort of say, like, Hey, like, where, where's your head on this? Well, I mean, that's, <laughs> we, we could go the next hour on this one, Ralph. Um, okay. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of different elements to your question and I'll, I'll kind of handle them piece by piece. And then if I miss anything, you can certainly follow up. So you're right. We've never been a program that's dependent on transfers. Uh, you know, from day one, our slogan here has been recruit, retain, develop. And I think if anything, it just makes us uh, look at our current model and probably reinforces it. Um, that we have to provide the, the best experience we can for our student athletes. And we have to deliver what we promise in recruiting so they don't want to go on the portal. Um, and, and so I, I don't, view this as, you know, hey, the way that we run our program is going to change. I think it just makes us double down and we got to do a better job with how we run things. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure and, and Will can back me up on this, but I think right now, Ralph, we're the only program in the country uh, that's been the five straight bowls with a 90% graduation rate and a 990 APR score. And so that model of recruiting players that fit Wake Forest, that stay, that graduate, and you look at the amount of players here that have blossomed in their fourth and fifth year, whether that be Boogie Basham, Justin Haran, Phil Haynes, you know, that, that's our formula. And so I don't think we're suddenly going to change our formula. We're suddenly not going to start beating Alabama and Clemson and Georgia on five-star recruits. You know, that's just not who we are. Uh, our program has always been based on recruiting kids and student athletes that fit our school institutionally, uh, that fit our program character wise, um, that we feel given time in our program with development can be competitive uh, with the better schools in our league. And I think if you look at over the last four or five years, we're in the top third of the ACC in wins. So that model is working and we're not going to change it. We just got to get better at it. However, um, I would say this. One of the things I used to say about Wake Forest is our mistakes don't leave. So if we recruited a young man who wasn't good enough to play here, he wasn't going to leave because he didn't want to give up the Wake Forest education and sit a year. And so in some ways, some of the players that weren't good enough to play for us um, are now leaving, which has freed up scholarships for us to recruit um, 
a Christian Turner um, and make our roster better. So my biggest concern, like this is going to happen, you know, you're, we're past the point of fighting it. Uh, I think at this point you have to embrace it because it is our, re- our new reality. Um, but I think we just got to do a great job within our program. You know, my biggest concern with it is just the windows of time that players can go into the portal. So let's say that we sign 25 players in a year and suddenly, uh, uh, you know, in June or July, two or three running backs decide to leave. You know, what do you do? You've used your 25 scholarships. You can't sign anybody else. Um, you know, even in the professional sports leagues with free agency, you know, there's windows of times that there can be movement. And, you know, I guess I would just like to see, um, you know, that to, to me, there should be windows that they can do this. You know, if a player leaves on you a week before your first game in the fall, because they don't like their role, um, you know, the impact it can have on your team, even from a health and safety standpoint, if you don't have people at that position, you know, that, that's the challenge of this. So when it comes out, uh, I, you know, I, I think we just like to see, hey, you can have one-time transfers, uh, there's freedom of movement, you know, but you'd like there to be some type of windows of when the players could do this, just so you can react with your own team. And if I could just one follow up again, I know you're not necessarily looking for a team with a bunch of transfers, but these players are available. There's going to be more of them than ever. Do you in any way tinker with the structure of your, uh, I guess would be, you know, player personnel department, um, whatever that looks like and say, Hey, listen, we need a couple more eyes on the portal here. Just, just, you know, give me a list of, a couple of people that maybe would fit Wake Forest that would be a good fit here. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're coming through a COVID budget year. So going to our athletic director and president right now asking for a uh, college scouting division of personnel aren't the things that are going to fly real well here. Um, you know, if, if you want to make a donation, we'll certainly name that position after you, Ralph. Uh, you know, and I, I mean, Ralph, the same challenges that we have uh, recruiting high school players in terms of our um, academic requirements, you know, we have those same challenges in, in the transfer market. Uh, it's still, there's very few players who go in that portal that number one, that we can get admitted. And the second challenge here is the credits that we'll accept that, um, you know, Wake Forest is a a very academic school um, and it's a challenging course load here. And for us to be able to accept credits uh, from another institution, um, it's usually, you know, they have to be uh, somewhat, you know, they have to be strenuous academic courses. So when I go into that portal and we look at those things, the percentage of players that in that portal that number one, we can get accepted and number two will transfer enough credit so that they're eligible. Um, you know, th- those are our two challenges. So again, this is where, when you look at those things, I think it just goes back to, it reinforces our initial model that we have to do a great job of recruiting high school players uh, that fit our school that value the degree that football is important to, and we'll, we'll be able to add transfers now and then, yes. Um, is that a market that we're gonna have to be dependent on to sustain success in our program? Uh, I think that would be a very iffy proposition. Thanks, Dave, and, and thanks to all the reporters for letting me barge in here, appreciate it. Yeah, good to see you, Ralph. Well, I didn't say anything there that they're gonna misquote me on, did I? No, you're good, Coach. Okay. Well, hey, we gotta have some like red buzzer setups. Say, hey, don't go there. So, along those lines, Dave, is there any movement on the Casey Washington story? 
there's movement less. We're still working on it. So we're, uh, you know, the, the book's not over. I'm not, I'm not overly optimistic about it, but we're continuing to see what we can do to try to try to keep them here. I was going to give you one week relief on asking that, but since the topic was right there. No, I'd be disappointed last if you gave me that week. So, um, you know, there's, there's no news to report and I don't know if there will be before the end of the semester. So we're still in touch with them and we're still making uh, efforts to, uh, you know, we'd like to keep him here. Like I said, he's a good player. He's a good person. He's a good young man. Um, and we're going to do what we can, but at the same point, whatever he decides to do, we support him. He did nothing wrong. This is not a discipline issue or anything that he didn't do correctly. Anything else for coach guys? I was just curious, Dave, about your quarterbacks, your young quarterbacks, and kind of how that development curve has gone this spring with those guys in terms of trying to find, you know, a good number two, a pecking order, that kind of thing. Yeah, we're, we're giving, uh, you know, Michael and Mitch a lot of work. We're giving those guys a lot of work, and we feel really good about both of them. So they're both very good players. Uh, they're both hit. I'm guessing it's not just me, right? No, I think we all lost him. I asked the quarterback question. Of course, that's when it goes down. <laughs> Kelly, we're just not prepared for you to ask questions. No, I guess I should have just let it go. He was about to say they're both terrible. We don't like them. No, I'm kidding. Of all the years to be scared of a quarterback question, though, this is the one that's easy. Yeah. <laughs> you said he's got Michael and, and Mitch. Yeah, those guys are both making really good progress. Uh, we're getting them a lot of work. Uh, they're developing, and we feel really good about both of them. How's that for a non-answer? Anything else for Coach, guys? All right. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, right. Thank you, everyone.